Yeah, there we go. So I'll start recording now. So yesterday, my memory serves me right. We were talking about software inspections when power on my uh, on my phone have so not phone sorry my laptop have shut off. All right, so today we're gonna be talking about inspections again. Maybe doing even a little bit of an exercise. Um, so the benefit of inspections, which is a much more formal way, a much more uh, uh, structured way of doing uh, a VNV of an artifact, any type of artifact, doesn't because it's a static type of analysis. So I can do it on my requirements document, my design document, my my actual source code. Very very commonplace that we actually get to do the inspections, or even even the tests. I can do inspections on them, and it does rise up the cost of my my development at first. But that tends to be at the, uh, uh, at, for the benefit of reducing the cost a little later on. Because if you don't do these inspections at the beginning, you tend to suffer quite a bit at the end. And it's actually a, a, a very popular technique. I don't know how much it happens here in companies in Saudi Arabia, but I know in bigger companies in, in North America, they actually do that. Because it, it's been statistically proven. If you do have that capital that you can spend on inspections at first, so if you have it, you can spend like uh, you know half a million reals or something, but you'll save like three million reals because of the issues that you find because of it. Now, unlike walkthroughs, which is you know we're winging it, we're hot dogging it. Uh, inspections are a lot more formal, a lot more structured. You have a team. Every team has a role. Every team member has a role to play. One of the most important of these roles is the moderator. He's the one that controls the show. Make sure everyone is on track and everybody knows their jobs. Okay, you got number two here: the coder, the implementer, the, the owner of the the the, um, the artifact that is going to be that is going to be inspected, and that usually is the most annoyed person of the entire meeting because we're we're grilling, right? We're criticizing and we're grilling, scrutinizing also his his, his work. We got the inspectors, okay, that do all of the legwork. Okay, we got a recorder, okay. The recorder is the one that writes down any flags, any violations. What are these violations? Again, we said we have a checklist, and then we look at the the uh, the, the the thing that we're checking. We have a checklist. We look at the thing that we're checking. Every time we sign a, vi a violation, according to what's actually written in the checklist, and we sign, we find that violation inside my source code. Then I would record. Now, the recording could be done by the inspectors. Very common or it could be done by a moderator. And then we finally have a reader, okay? Now the reader is whoever, we can do the reading in two approaches. Either one person reads to the entire group. So we go through the artifact and everybody's looking at the same thing. And we go through the artifact at the same pace, all right? So I read it out loud and we have everybody focus on the same line at the same time. And hopefully with then, then any sort of inspection issues would have been uncovered. Or we could just let every inspector read for themselves and everybody can go at their own pace. Some of them are quicker, some of them are not as quick. Yes. Yeah, artifact is any document, anything that you produce it's called an artifact. It's a very generic term. So an artifact could be a requirements document, could be a design document, could be a, even a test plan. Okay. Now, uh, what I want you to do, I want to give you a bit of a, a flavor of, of, of doing um, some inspection. So if you, can, if you guys get on Moodle, please. Even at home, if you can, if you can get on Moodle. out of this for a moment. No. So if you if you get on Moodle you'll see I have an inspection exercise. All right, if you click on that, you'll see two documents, okay? 
The first of which is called the Java inspection list and the second is called, uh, it's, it's the Java file. So what I want you to do for the next maybe 10 minutes or so is to, uh, is to look at the inspection list and try to find any violation in that Java file. Okay, we're not gonna do it like 100% thoroughly, but that's just to give you an idea of what it sort of like feels like. And it's, it's, a, bit of, it's a bit of work, okay? Um, okay. So if, I, I strongly suggest that you open the Java file with some sort of a, a, a source code editor rather than just open it with Notepad. You can open the, the, the Java doc. Okay. Now, before you actually do all of this, let me just, I want to just show you something. I also posted this morning under handouts, there's another folder called inspection checklist. In it, you'll see the Java inspection checklist document that you're just using. There's another one right underneath it. It's called a larger Java inspection checklist, and it's a lot more thorough, a lot, a lot more complicated, right? And it requires a lot more technical skill. And then finally, I, there's, another thing called a use case inspection checklist. And that again, just to show you that not every inspection checklist has to be about source code. All right. So they can be applied to anything as well, but that's, that's for you to, uh, to, 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 to investigate at your own time. We're not going to be doing an, an, an inspection today on Diagram. We're going to be looking at this Java file, speed adjustment coordinator Java file. And if you can open up the checklist, all right, you'll see there is a number of things to check for. So let me just open up this. So the checklist would contain something like that. Blah, 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 blah. Handouts. screen share everything is shared anyways i don't have to like go like share screen this share screen that yeah i just shares everything oh did i but it's actually it's showing here that it's actually sharing everything on i don't mind share only this one yeah okay i see okay so let, let's do this let's do just uh number one Okay, so number one says, are descriptive variable and constant names used? Is every var uh, variable and attribute properly initialized? Do all attributes have proper access modifiers like private, protected, or actually you can just ignore the last one for now. You can do also um, number three. Okay, so in the first one you do A and B, and the last one you do number three. Share computer. So how, how do I make it just to share one thing only? Optimize screen sharing for clip no. But if I go like that. But I'm on that, so I'm not sharing. It just says share. Usually yeah, I don't understand. I just it just says share for me. <laughs> uh, right. well anyway, you can go ahead and keep working on the exercise. Uh, we're only doing that uh, inspection exercise, not the other one. Yeah, yeah, the other one is a handout. It's just for you to, you know, an FYI kind of thing. All right. And that, again, just to give you an idea. So you'll be playing the role of an inspector. You'll be playing the role of an inspector who are doing your own reading as well, not just, um, not just the inspections, okay? And, and, and you can see after a little while, it's gonna get a little difficult because it is quite a bit of effort. So it, it gets tiring a little bit. And this is why we tend to use an inspection team rather than an inspector, one single individual. Okay, we have a whole team. So in case one person misses something, another person will catch it. If another person catch it, doesn't miss, it doesn't catch it, then another person will catch it and so on. Uh, 
yeah, yeah, yeah. Any any source code, you can open it with Notepad if you if you if you well, you're using Mac. I don't you don't have a Notepad. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. There's a text editor, some sort. Any any sort of text editor. But usually, if you're using an editor for source code, they tend to be better because they tend to they do the coloring and the sort of thing that you don't see it with a regular text editor. Okay, so Banana, any, any questions, Banana? No. Okay, guys at home, Ibrahim, um, Abdurrahman, uh, are, are you following me? Do you have this, this exercise up? Yes. Okay, Ibrahim? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're not gonna do it from start to finish, but I'm gonna give you like 10 minutes. And then at the end, I'm gonna ask you like, how many violations did you find and so on and so forth. Try Visual Studio, use Visual Studio. Visual Studio. Then open it with this, it's fine. Also curious about something when you do all of this. Yeah, so for the first one, just first do the first A and B of the first one, and then you can do number three. Number three, just a constructor thing. It'll take you one second because it's only one file. I'm also curious if I do an annotation. That should work. They're not, uh, what? Uh, they, uh, they don't have a type, but they're not, they're not, they're just. Which checklist item are you referring to that is in violation of? Well, two, uh, one B type. One B. Is every variable and attribute properly initialized? Yes, yeah, initialized. It's just initialized with a variable. Okay. I mean, as, as you can see, there's a, there's a variable on those. Equals SV, what I mean is. Yeah, yeah, equals SV. Obviously, SV would have been received by something else. Yeah, SV is received by something else. The meat is for feed buffer, food control, and can feed. Yeah. The first one. It's not initialized as int or as double. Well, no, it has to be at some point. It has to be. Uh, unless, unless this is, um, what, what is this? This is a constructor? Oh, it, it's probably uh, inherited. Oh, okay. Because okay. that's actually a file from a much, much bigger project.
you'll see that file again when I give you your project a little later on in the course. But uh. Rahman, how how many violations did you find so far? Well, I'm seeing it uh, fine. There is not any like uh, problems. There's no violations. Okay. I see it as very clear. Abraham, uh, did you find any violations? Maybe the last violation only, the the length of the method. And Ibrahim, Ibrahim Swaram, did you find any, any issues, any violations of the checklist? Not yet. Okay. Well, maybe I, I, I picked up the wrong file, because that's actually code that I've written some time ago. I, I still thought that maybe you'll be able to find some, uh, some irregularities, but I should have like brought in some, uh, some defective code from the internet and showed it to you so that you can actually find a whole bunch of issues but I only I only thought of this exercise like this morning I said well instead of just me talking about inspections without you actually seeing what's it about I thought maybe I'll give you a taste of it or your SE um, uh, 100, anything, okay? And just look at it and kind of like see, oh, I made this. It, part of your project is gonna get to do some inspections on some of the files, okay? Anyway, so back again here. Um, so the inspection process comes in, in, in a number of phases, okay? It begins with an overview followed by individual planning and then the actual meeting takes place, some rework and follow-up. Uh, the most important really work is, is, the, is the first three steps and we begin with the overview and what you want to do in the overview is to tell the team what is it that has been inspected and why is it important for us to inspect it. Okay, there's nothing that will give you um, a low effort or, or low diligence in the type of work that you're doing if the person is not feeling motivated about the work that they're doing that they feel like what they're doing is not really important. Okay, so you want to explain the importance of the artifact that you are checking and why is it that any issue or any defect in those files could be quite problematic. Then you want to be able to designate the team roles. Okay, so you're going to be an inspector, you're going to be a reader, you're going to be the code author and so on. Next up, we have the preparation, uh, which you didn't actually do quite a bit of it when we're doing that exercise, but in the preparation, um, we get to do some ranking uh, and distribution of error types. So in the Java checklist, you saw the, uh, the uh, distribution of the error types based on different categories, it's category one, two, three, four. It doesn't really have ranking that checklist file that you have, but sometimes um, some violations are a lot more important are a lot more of a bigger deal than other violations. So you wanna rank them as higher. And again, it's all about letting the inspector give more attention and focus to those higher rank um, uh, checklist items because any violation of those could be revealing quite big problems a little later on. Checklists uh, of clues on finding errors, that's another thing, okay? So instead of just letting the person wander completely clueless to a document and look for, uh, looking for violation of that item on a checklist, you can tell them where to find it. For example, we tend to find variables at the top of a file, okay? You tend to find a constructor to being the first function in the list of functions that exists. So we can actually tell that those clues 
two are inspected and it makes the inspection process a lot more efficient instead of just wandering around in some big black hole. Then comes the inspection meeting. And in the inspection meeting, uh, we have a reader. Okay, it gets to be chosen by the moderator. A lot of the time, the reader is the moderator themselves. Every element of logic and branch is considered. In other words, the entire document is considered. The objective is to find errors. And when I say errors, I'm not talking about bugs, but I'm talking about violations of items written in the checklist. We're not specific solution hunting, okay? This exercise is completely not about, this is the way it should be done. This is the way uh, we can solve this problem. That's left for reviews. That's left for walkthroughs, which we're gonna talk about in a moment, okay? The moderator then prepares a report, usually within one day saying, this is what the inspectors found. If, if, uh, um, uh, sorry. And then they give it back to the, to the uh, author, to obviously fix the errors that it was flagged by the inspectors. If the amount of work or if the amount of flags are more than 5%, and again, 5% is not really a math thing, it's a subjective from one organization to the next. And if it's too high, then maybe you wanna redo the whole inspection process again. So go fix it and then we'll do another inspection meeting. If it's very low, then you can just take care of it and do the inspection and come back to me after you're done, okay? So that would be the inspection process. As you can see, there is quite a bit of a difference between this and walkthroughs. Okay, I remember Abdurrahman, you were asking about this last lecture. So there's a whole lot of differences, not just the fact that you use a checklist or not, this is the item number four. But before we get to item number four, okay, first, one of the differences is that inspections themselves are a, uh, a formal process. So the moderator has to have some formal training. Okay, with walkthroughs, this is not the case. In inspections, everybody has a role, right? In walkthroughs, everybody's playing the same role. Okay, who tends to drive the process in inspection? It's the moderator. Whereas we don't have such thing as a moderator to begin with when we're doing walkthroughs. It's usually the person who owns the code, kind of like what you were doing in SC100 back in the day when you were checking your own code, making sure that everything is correct. All right, um, inspections use checklists. All right, so you look at the checklist, then you look at the artifact that you're checking. With walkthrough, there's no checklist. You're just looking straight at the uh, item that you are or the artifact that you are checking, okay? It tends to be no follow-up with, with walkthroughs. You're the person, you're the one who's doing the checking anyway, so once you're done with that meeting, then you're done. Whereas with inspection, there might be a follow-up. Just in general, inspections is a lot more formal than to uh, uh, even screen sharing for some reason. I know, I know. It's working now, okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I probably uh, that's another mistake I've done. I've used the Wi-Fi of the internet. I probably just use 4G. It's a lot better. Okay. Um, okay. Last thing we said, we have inspections, walkthroughs, and reviews. Uh, and this thing I, I shouldn't have. Uh, um, and you should be able to take this control off to hide. Hide video panel. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, that's better. All right, so inspections and walkthroughs, we tend to look for, you know, did this thing that we built, did we build it correctly? 
With walkthroughs, it's a bit more direct. We're actually looking for mistakes. Okay, maybe some alternatives to improve things. With inspections, we're looking for violations based on a checklist, which we hope would then reveal bugs later on, which then comes in the form of did we build the did we build it right? Okay. Reviews is a little bit different. Now, reviews is just as informal as walkthroughs, but it does have a bit of a different purpose than walkthroughs in that reviews tend to have a main purpose of checking that um, the, the, the thing that we're building is actually according to the specification that we have, all right? And making sure we have tolerable levels of quality. In other words, we're making sure that we're going to be building the right product, okay? So it happens earlier on in the process and it's not a case of trying to find bugs or trying to find alternative ways of improving the internal quality, but rather just making sure that this thing that we're going to be building, it's actually what it needs to begin with. All right. Now, remember I said BNB verification and validation. Okay. Validation is, is making sure are we building the right product, whereas verification is saying, did we build the product right? And we said last lecture that validation is something that we tend to do at the beginning, okay? Because obviously you wanna make sure that you, we're gonna be building the right product before we commit to building it. And verification is something we have to do at the end because we gotta actually create something. Then we check if it's actually doing it correctly. So uh, with respect to reviews and walkthroughs and inspections, okay, we can actually say that reviews because we're trying to make sure that it's conforming to the requirements and that we're gonna be building the right product, which we haven't built just yet. So reviews would be a type of verification or validation. I can hear you. Okay, uh, guys at home. So guys, uh, guys in, the, uh, in the room saying validation. Guys at home, what do you say? Validation. Validation, okay, so it's correct, it's validation. All right, walkthroughs. So guys at the class saying verification, guys at home, what do you say? Verification. Uh, verification. Ver verification, yes, absolutely correct. Finally, inspections. Verification. Verification. Uh, verification as well, exactly, exactly. And that would be it for this chapter. And this is the only chapter that we're covering in this course that covers static analysis and tends to be the driest part of the course. It's gonna get a lot more interesting and a lot more technical as we move on, right, but before I move on to chapter three, any questions? Because you're at home and those of you are here, any questions about this material? All right. So part of your project, you'll get to do some, some inspections, but um, we'll get to the project thing a little later on in the course. So let me just stop this over here. And let's open up the next. That we uh, are going to start part number three, software testing, dynamic analysis. All right. Yeah, you know, I know it sounds really fun that we've already finished static analysis, so we only have dynamic. So maybe like another week and a half and we're done with the course. But that, there's a lot of work that goes into dynamic analysis because it's the most technical part of the uh, of the software VNV process. Okay. Going to look at a lot of definitions from now on. And we need to be able to be very clear about what these definitions mean. Uh, we're gonna introduce the testing process, the people involved. Gonna discuss again, the importance of testing. So the cost versus benefit of testing. And then more terms that we get to use interchangeably before we know what they really mean, things like fault and error and failure. And we tend to say, you know, well, they all mean the same and everybody who's outside of the software engineering domain will tend to refer to them exactly the same way. However, in the world of software testing, they do have very, very specific meanings, okay? So again, some formal definitions about the word testing and what testing is saying here. Any activity aimed at evaluating an attribute 
or a capability of a program or a system. It is the measurement of software quality. Another definition says it's the act of executing tests. So that's the hands-on part. Tests are designed. Yes, actually some effort goes into designing a test and thinking about it in a systematic way. Then they're executed to demonstrate the correspondence between an element and its specification. Okay, so ultimately this is what we're trying to do. It's a verification activity and we're making sure that the specification, which at this point we're assuming that we understood it correctly, that this thing that we've created uh, and we have a mental concept of it in our mind, is it the same and is it really in line with the specification that it should be actually doing? Uh, Maya says the process of executing a program with the intent of finding errors. That's absolutely correct. IEEE tends to be the last body to come in with a formal definition. And it tends to one, they like to encompass everything that everybody else said into one single statement. So this is how it reads. It's the process of exercising or evaluating a system or a system component by manual or automated means to verify that it satisfies a specific requirement or to identify differences between what is expected and the actual result. So it's one sentence that really encompasses everything related to software testing. It is in an informal way, it's the correctness of the software with respect to its requirements, the performance of the software under various conditions. Okay, so it's not necessarily just this is the input and this is the output and that's it, but sometimes we're looking at for a purpose of fit and the performance um, within say bottlenecks of executions, how much load and how much stress can it handle. Next up is the robustness of the software. Robustness is a very important quality aspect. We talked about this in uh, 310. Oh yeah, you didn't take 310 with me. Okay, never mind, never mind. So robustness, what it actually means in the world of software is the ability of software to be able to handle some airiness input. Errors can happen because of some bugs that we have in the code. Errors can happen because of some uh, faulty input that I receive from another machine or from a human being, it tends to be a lot of times from human beings. And basically it's the ability of our software to shove away these airless input and say, okay, you've done something stupid here. I'm not gonna crash and burn. I'm just gonna keep on going, okay? Whereas a very not so robust piece of software is the one that at the slightest mistake and the slightest issue, it crashes and burns and dies and says, ah, oh, you've done something silly. I can't work like this anymore and it just freezes, okay? So that's definitely not a, um, not a good thing. So robustness is something that we check for, right? In a lot of hardware systems, we tend to have what we call um, replica and uh, redundant systems. So that if one fails, we have another system kicks in and if another one fails, we have another system kicks in, okay? But nonetheless, robustness is something that we want or something that we need. Um, Installation and other facets of the software release. You can also consider that as part of the software testing. Um, we don't really cover that much in this course, uh, release, a release engineer or a deployment engineer and so on. And kind of like adding the different versions of the different software uh, and releasing the different version and making sure that you have the uh, dependency between the different packages correctly done in your uh, in, in in your release so that it doesn't give you syntax errors okay so sometimes you have to like compile this package then you compile that package then you compile this package. and if you do it if you do the order wrong okay for our systems that we've been creating so far because they're so simple and a lot of them they're just in the main package or maybe a couple of packages then we tend to just press f5 or is it f8 and it just compiles the whole thing for us but some other systems that could be really really big maybe even the code placed in different locations ge geographically. So um, part of getting the work, the code to work correctly is to make sure that these synchronizations are aligned pretty well, okay? Now, the ultimate goal of testing is to establishing confidence, okay? And I said before with the word confidence, something we're gonna go over, over and over and over so many times in this course, that the software does what it's supposed to do and, uh, Obviously the second holy grail is something that we've discussed before in the course outline is that the software is not doing what is not supposed to do. Second one obviously is a lot trickier because it could be an infinite set of 
things that it's not supposed to do, okay? Which then rises the whole concept of cost versus benefit and when is it that I should cut my, my cost because I'm not getting much benefit afterwards. And we go back again to the whole thing about establishing confidence because we'll never be able to say that we're 100% defect free anyways. You know, you never want to put your life on the line for that. So all you're doing is establish a level of confidence and the higher the level of confidence, obviously the much more effort that it will be required. Yes. Mm. Yeah. What if it's doing something extra? For example, you, you want to send a hundred reals to your brother. Okay. What if you, uh, you do that and it does send the hundred reals to your brother, which you do what supposed to do, but then it goes and sends a hundred reals to some, some merchant at the end of the road, which is not what he asked it to do. So we care about that. It's not doing that too. So it's not good enough that it did send the hundred reals to your brother, which is what you intended, which is what you wanted, but you don't want it to send a hundred reals to somebody, some random person that you didn't really know about. Exactly. It's infinite. You know, what are the things that it's not supposed to do? Infinite. Well, that's one of the things that it's not supposed to do, but is it everything that it's not supposed to do? No, there's a lot of other things. Okay. So, you know, a, a lot of times I like to give the example that, you know, what if it gives you a smiley face when it's not supposed to do? Then you look at it and you say, all right, smiley face doesn't hurt. But at the same time, I wasn't expecting that. And so, you know, what if it's a symptom of something bigger, some bigger problem? Uh, I, have, I use this. Oh, you want to use the microphone? Is it, is it making uh, interference with you? I'm, I'm not sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, please. Uh, come, come, come. I don't know where it is exactly. No, that's okay. That's all right. That's all right. Yeah, yeah, please. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. well, no, no, it's all right. Sorry. Well, then you're lucky that you're still there. Huh? <laughs> okay. Sorry, sorry. That's all right. <laughs> Say what? Sorry again? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's still, I mean, if I get the smiley face, I wasn't expecting a smiley face, then I'll be worried. Okay, because I wasn't expecting it to happen. Okay, what if this time it was a smiley face and next time it was like zero your bank account? <laughs> right? All right. Uh, testing is not debugging. Debugging is what have to happen after you do the testing. So when you do the testing and you find a bug, then we get to do debugging. Uh, debugging is, um, there's two, uh, three parts to debugging. First of all is to, because all testing does says something went wrong. Debugging, first step, you got to find out where did it actually go wrong. Number two, fix it. And number three, say what? Well, no, it's not about launching it. Test it again, okay? So even the debug itself could itself cause other problems and other issues. Not necessarily at the same part of the code that uh, we've just fixed, okay? But now that this part is working correctly, some other parts, which you have an error in is now showing its deficiencies. Okay. Testing is not quality assurance. Quality assurance tends to be a, a, um, a larger concept, right? And tends to be more, more like a department. And it defines a lot of things other than just testing. Okay. So it defines V and V activities in an organization. And it defines also levels of acceptable qualities and, and processes and standards. Okay. So the QA department tends to be filled with people who are software testing engineers to begin with. They would say something like, okay, uh, you're allowed to uh, release the product with, you know, with no more than, 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 than 10 intermediate bugs in it, okay? Or no more than 20 trivial bugs, no more than two critical bugs. 
And yes, believe it or not, people do release software knowing that there's bugs inside. Okay, because we gotta make money and we gotta release it. And we know it, we, we, we're gonna get to it, but right now we gotta release. We're losing money every day. We're not releasing, okay? And a lot of times it could be a PR thing. So say right now, in November 21st, 2021, we'll be releasing version blah, blah, blah of Windows. Come to November 20th, don't tell me that, oh, we wanna postpone a week because, because we got some bugs. We'll release, and then we'll release what we call patches. Okay, so the little yellow bubble that you get at the bottom, that's just bugs that we haven't gotten to fix before we released it, okay? Uh, they'll say things like, uh, who's supposed to report to who, and these sort of, you know, bureaucracy things. They'll say things like, uh, with inspections, how much and how many hours of inspections you should be spending on a document. So they'll set all these standards. So quality assurance tends to be cover all of these, things and it's not just software testing okay part of the work obviously is to say how many how, how much software testing you should be doing how many tests you should be creating and so on okay. I have a question yeah uh, how do you say that an error is critical or uh, this severe um, it, it obviously it's a judgment call but you know let's just say you have a, a, an error that it made your software crash and burn Okay, I mean, that obviously subjectively it was something that you would put as critical. What if we're talking about a safety critical system and you can see that this bug causes an airplane to go nose down <laughs> into, into, into the dirt or into the sea? <laughs> obviously, you would count that as a critical error. What if, again, it's a, it's a, it's a mission critical system like a banking system and you saw, you saw money floating around aimlessly large amount of sums of money, then you probably want to put down as, as critical. Okay. All right. Now here's something that maybe that's not so critical. You maybe have a little light, little light bulb at the side of a cabin and it's kind of like for reading somebody wants to read and you, and you push the button and it didn't light up. Okay. Not the biggest deal in the world. Okay. So it could be a trivial issue, you know, so you want it, you want it to, when you press the button, it lights up, but you press the button, it didn't light up. All right, not, not the biggest problem in the world. The airplane is going to be fine. Nobody's going to be at risk and so on. So Abdurrahman was asking, I don't know, I noticed that you didn't. Abdurrahman was asking, how do you define something to be critical, intermediate, or trivial? And I said, it's, you know, you just use a judgment. There's no math to it. I, I forgot that you can't listen and only me. <laughs> so Abdurrahman. <laughs> the students in the classroom are looking. I was like, "Why are you talking? To Why are you bringing this subject?" <laughs> and after like three minutes of looking at puzzled faces, I figured, "Oh, they didn't hear your question." Uh, okay, <laughs> I just gotta get into the habit of repeating questions that I hear over the mic, over the speaker. And by the way, just to let you know, uh, those of you at home, uh, I had a professor come in. They forgot their mic and the camera in the in the classroom. This is why I had to pause for a moment. Okay, so those couple of slides we've already covered. Okay, so <laughs> why is it that we do testing? Okay, millions of reals or dollars could be lost. Okay, so that tends to be a very easy motivation. Uh, you want to, for mission critical systems, many lives could be lost. So again, that is something very important that we want to be doing testing for. So we can't lack any motivation here. Obviously, something intangible, something that you can't put a number on is, say, your reputation. You don't want to be the one who creating software that the, the market keeps saying, oh, this company keeps producing faulty software that keeps crashing. So your reputation and the customer confidence in you could be lost. Okay. Now, let's tease your brain a little bit. Okay. And I want to talk to you about something called the fisherman's dilemma. All right, uh, you can look at me, all right? Uh, so let's just say you went on a fishing trip for three days. There's a lake, there's two lakes in that fishing trip. And you went to day number one. Can you just say, I'm gonna tell you the same thing as here. You can just like listen to me, okay? So day number one, you went to Lake A. You went fishing, you caught 20 fish. It's a good day. Day two, you go to Lake B, you'd go fishing, 
and you caught three fish, three fish only, a lot less, okay? Day number three, would you go back to Lake A or do you spend it on Lake B? Okay, so Sadun says A. Okay. A. Like B? A, okay, Banan says A. Next, so who said Ibrahim, that was you? Uh, yes. Okay, and Father Abdurrahman? I think I, you have to provide more information because the, well, that's all the information I can give you. <laughs> Abraham, uh, I'm sorry, Abdurrahman, diplomatic as always. You got to give me more information. Uh, this is the information that I can give you. Okay. Because you went to the two lakes, day one, Lake A, 20 fish, day two, Lake B, three fish. Where are you going to go with Lake? The which lake are you going to go to on day three? The one with the um, most fish. Okay, so the one with the most fish. Now, now, I can have a counter argument to this, and you can probably already guess what my counter argument is. A is the one you <laughs> caught 20 fish in, and B is the one you caught three fish in. Say what? Uh, you go to B. Oh, okay, so Banan just switched sides here from A to B. Okay, now, let me just put this to rest. Uh, who was saying that, Ibrahim? Uh, no, 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 me, doctor. I was going to say that maybe the counter oh, argument fact. would be uh, that the, the, the lake you didn't catch many fish in uh, would be better because it still has more fish because you didn't catch all of them yet. Exactly. So I'm just going to repeat what you said, Fat, to the people in the classroom because they couldn't hear you. Uh, so Fat is saying the counter argument, which you're probably already guessing, okay, that the lake B that I only had some bad luck in and I only caught three, maybe there's actually a lot more fish left for me to catch on day three. Whereas in Lake A, where I had a really good day that morning, the first day, maybe it was only 20 fish and I caught them all. Okay. Now, just to put this argument to rest, there's no actually correct solution per se. There's no actually correct solution. It's it just like Abdurrahman was saying, you got to give me more information. Okay. Well, the world doesn't give you a lot more information. What I can tell you, it tends to be that the, the artifact that you did find more bugs in, more fish in, if you find more, this probably is a lot more. That's tend to be the trend. If you find less, there tends to be a lot less left, okay? And that also you gotta multiply in with the level of confidence that you've established, how much thorough, were your testing efforts to begin with? All right. <clears throat> so this is called the fisherman's dilemma and relates very well to, to software testing. Now, some personnel terminology, you're gonna hear these terms quite often. Um, there's something Okay, as an IT professional is in charge of the testing activities related to designing the, 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 the tests, um, running any test scripts, okay, which we're gonna talk about in a moment, producing the actual results, analyzing the results to see if they pass or fail, and reporting it to some sort of a manager. The uh, manager, on the other hand, is in charge of one or more test engineers. Um, they get to set the policies and the processes, they maybe interact with other managers, with other projects, all right? Or, and otherwise they just keep helping the engineers, the test engineers in doing their work, okay? If you look at the slide over here, so we got the test engineer at the top. They are um, managing a whole bunch of people. All right, let me just do, okay? So the test manager is managing the entire process, okay? Now, somebody that the, the, the analyst, or the programmer have created a piece of code, okay, and they put it in the computer. Now the test engineer comes and they start to create tests. They design those tests. It's better that if those tests are executable so that I can get to write some sort of a script that will execute those tests automatically for them. Sometimes those tests could run in the hundreds and thousands, by the way. Huh? So you build, a keep, you build a test suite and it keeps increasing, increasing, increasing. And you don't want to go like every single test yourself and you input the inputs numbers and stuff. So test script writing is a big, big deal. And 
he just basically says run all and it runs like 5,000 tests and comes back with a report for you. Okay. And you just keep adding to the suite. You just keep adding to the suite. But anyway, so the test engineer will actually run the test. Okay. Uh, the, the, the software running on your computer is going to produce an output. And then the test engineer comes back and evaluates that output to see if it's equal to what is being expected. Okay. Then they report back to the test manager saying, all right, this is the situation that we have that we have. What do you want to do next? All right. Is, is this slide clear? Okay. And guys at home too, everything clear? Yeah. Okay, good. So uh, how much does testing cost? Ideally, it should cost around 50% of your software development budget, okay? Because it does require about at least 50% of the effort. So roughly being 50% of the time and your, and your money is, is spent on software testing. I'm saying that ideally, all right? At the university, what students tend to do is that testing tends to happen like five minutes before, even then, sometimes not. But in the real world, you have to do some testing. I don't think anybody would have any confidence to release something without doing some level of testing. Okay. So ideally, like I said, it should put in a good 50%. Um, in general, we can't test everything exhaustively. Okay. Like I said before, if we have a line of code A equals B plus C, you can't just say, well, I put down three and four and it gives me a seven, so it works. It, you can, you've only proven that it works with three and four. You didn't prove anything else, All right? So just one line of code like that, could, you could spend forever, and forever doing it, but it's not cost effective to continue testing at this point. Can a formal correctness proof guarantee, uh, proof guarantee an error-free program? Um, a bit of a debate on that. In order to allow this to happen, it's for even a formal mathematical logical approach to guarantee a defect free program, um, you need to have variables that are extremely limited. Okay. For example, you have two variables, A and B, A can take the values of zero and one, B can take the values of zero and one. So now how many combinations can I possibly have? Four. Yeah. Okay. Zero, 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 one, one, zero, all right. And so on, one, one. And if you try them all out, then you can say, well, I can, with so much confidence, basically say that I, this program is error-free, okay? So, but part of the work is you can't just let A roam free with, uh, with, with all sorts of values and B with all sorts of records, because you're gonna spend forever because the combinations would be endless, all right? So the sooner an error, an, an error can be found and corrected, the, the lower the cost of it to actually correct it. The costs tend to increase exponentially, all right? The later that you catch it. So although testing is, is something good, we wanna be able to find the bug. It's also good news, bad news sort of thing. Okay, it's good news that we found the bug before we released it, but bad news, it's actually quite late. And this is where those inspections that I was talking about in the last chapter, they really, really come in a lot of times, those inspections, those reviews, right? So that we can actually commit to building the right product. And if you look at this slide, maybe the light is not so well here, but believe it or not, coding, which we suffer with the most as students, tend to be the least of your worries when it comes to development, right? It's one of those things that learning it is difficult, but once you've learned it, it becomes a second language to you and, and you just don't trip and fall into coding errors later on, okay? They become no more than, as you can see maybe in this slide, 20%. The absolute majority of the issues, they come into play from the specification phase and it tends to be things like, oh, I misunderstood the requirements. We got the requirements wrong. It was incomplete, it was inconsistent, it was incorrect. Okay, and one of the main problems that we find with requirements is that a lot of times the customer don't actually know what they want to begin with. They'll tell you what they want, but they not necessarily be telling you what they actually need. Okay, so it could be inaccurate understanding of user requirement, late discoveries of some serious project flaws. Okay, 
So it could be that, uh, you know, integration of modules are not fitting together. So nowadays, uh, you might have heard of the term DevOps, DevOps, D-E-V, O-P-S. Yes, it does. Yeah. But the whole, the, the main thing behind DevOps is something called continuous integration. So that as you're building, you're no longer uh, worried about this big, massive integration between East and West. Okay. So back in the day, what would happen, you would have one department working on one big subsystem, another department not working about another big subsystem of the, of the software. And then they get together like a year and a half later and try to integrate it. And some major projects that failed because the integration just couldn't happen. All right. We have an unworthy build and release process. And again, I'm not going to get too much into these on the last one, but um, you know, there's something like you, the, the, the version number that you see at the end of a product. Okay. When you click at the about a piece of software and it says version like 3.45.123.6, each one of those numbers actually have a meaning and it's very, very important. It's very, very important that everybody in the team knows what the meaning of each one of these numbers is, okay? So that this is where engineering comes in. Remember I said this about two years ago, okay? The only difference between, or the main difference between software engineering and computer science is the scale of the problem. It's not the technicality of the problem, just the scale. And hitting the engineering scale means we're probably gonna be working with 20 people. And it just doesn't make sense that you'll just pick up the phone and say, hey, how are you with this one? How, how are you with that class? Did you finish this class? We can't be working like this, okay? So there's gotta be a build and release process and you check out code and you commit code, but in a structured manner, okay? Because otherwise we're gonna have an implementation team chaos, somebody who's actually created newer codes, but then what is actually being taken into the product is that person's older code. Right, you might might have experienced something similar to this if you have a project during your undergrad degree and you actually have four or five people working on it, and somebody would would have a newer version of a section of that document, but then what was actually submitted was that section you get from the professor. Your mark, you're saying, well, okay, that section, I'm going to deduct some marks because it wasn't done 100% correctly. The person will say, well, I swear I did it. But then when they actually get to look at the document, they'll see that, no, it's, it was actually the older version. Same thing happens in software development, okay? Like somebody would actually find a bug, they'll fix it, all right? But then what actually gets committed into the big product is an older version. So we simply cannot have that. Um, the last thing I'm gonna be talking about today is two concepts, they're called observability and controllability. Now, so far life has been easy when it comes to observability and control controllability and the work that we've been doing in our software development here in the university because what is it that you get to do when you wanna test your software, okay? You think of two numbers, okay? Or whatever values that you're gonna give as input, okay? 1,000, 100, 5, 6, 15, okay? And then you press enter, okay? And then you, you check the output, right? And the output is printed on the screen, nice and clear. And you can tell whether uh, your code has worked correctly or not. That means that this situation has offered quite a high, uh, um, a high level of both controllability and observability. That's not necessarily always the case, all right? So controllability, uh, I'm actually beginning with this one. Okay, observability, no, we'll begin with observability. Observability is the ability to actually see the output that I'm checking, okay? So we've got two things, input and checking the output. And we think it's pretty trivial that, oh, I'm just, I'll just look at the screen, the output is there. But maybe it's not, okay? So what if I'm gonna be doing some hit on a database, okay? Or 
for me to check the correctness of something, I have to do some checks on three or four databases. Okay. It gets much, much difficult to verify that this has worked correctly. Okay. It's not just simply a case of looking at the black screen with, or the white screen with the shell prompt and seeing that it has worked correctly. Here's another example, even trickier. Okay. That you want to see that event A has happened before event B. Okay. Not necessarily you put a system out then you can see it because it might be there's a racing issue. It's not actually as, as easy to see that. Another thing, for example, you want to make sure that after you press something that the result is produced less than 0 0.03 milliseconds. Again, it's very difficult to check that yourself. Okay. So maybe you rely on some printing mechanism to do that. But even the printing itself requires some time to print, which could slow down the output. So in other words, sometimes the observability of actually being able to check that the software is working correctly is difficult. And similarly, just as it might be difficult to check the output, it might be difficult to check the input or, or sorry, to provide the input. All right. And, and the ability to control the input, this is where the term controllability comes into play. And it's how easy it is to provide a program with the needed input or values for our behavior. Um, so it's easy to control software that we just give it for the key with the keyboard, the input. But what if it's something that requires sensors? All right. And the input is a certain intensity of light or a certain temperature degree. It, it suddenly gets a lot more complicated. Okay. What if it's a certain intensity of light and a certain intensity of degree uh, of temperature? All right. Again, it's a lot more difficult to just even provide the input. Some on you're in hell if you are facing a situation where the control controllability is low and the observability is also low. Okay. I, I know I know I said this is the last thing, but I, I just remember I, I want to talk about a couple other things. Um, more terms, prefix values and postfix values, prefix values. Okay, so that happens before a test actually takes into play. Again, with SE100, you run, then you begin right away with your input. But sometimes this is not the case. You have to set up the environment. So you actually have to keep giving that software a whole bunch of inputs in order just to set it up to be in the correct state. Okay. Yeah, I mean, for example, let's just, play, let's just say you're playing a game and you want to see if the knockout thing is happening like in Mortal Kombat or whatever games that you're playing nowadays. Okay. You know, you want to see if the knockout punch is working correctly. Where in order to do that, you got to get the two things to fight together so that one person is almost done so that you, then you can check the knockout, right? So that is a prefix value. A postfix value is input that I'm giving the software actually after the test has been completed. And I tend to give it for two reasons. One of which is sometimes I give it an input to actually check the output that was produced. Okay. So in situations where the observability is low, one way I can check and an, the output is I give it a test. I give it an input, some sort of a value, and then it will tell you, Okay, so do you want to see the result? Yes or no? Why? So why itself is an input, but I actually put the why after the test is executed so that I can see the test value. Okay, or maybe let's just say there's something more practical here. Um, I made a change to your transcript. Now it hit the database. I can't, I'm, I can't really see inside the database. Okay, but one thing I need to do is maybe I can pull up your transcript itself and see it. So in order to do that, I need to give the system your student ID. So this is what we call a verification value that I'm given in order to be able to check the output. Another thing I can do is exit commands. Exit commands tend to be inputs that I'm giving to the system after a test has been completed. And they are for the purpose of resetting the system and stabilizing the system to be in a stable situation. All right. So that is not in a vulnerable situation. All right. Not in a vulnerable state. Okay, so you might, for example, you've opened up a file, 
you've done something with it, all right, and now it's open for everybody. It's, it's a read for everybody. So you want to lock it again after your test is complete. You don't want to just leave with that file being read and write, for example, for everybody. Okay, that's not what we want. So the exit command is something I would give to say, okay, go back again and lock this file again, make it not read or write, just read. And if it's read, also permit such and such persons only to be able to see it. All right. Oh, uh, last thing, um, you probably already know that the concept of a script, script is a little piece of software that you write the test in. Uh, no, sorry, not write the test in. Um, sometimes you put the inputs in it and sometimes it's just a little piece of software that runs alongside the software that you want to test and you program it to check for certain things. Could be checking for given certain functions, values and checking for its output uh, or actually looking at certain um, structures of the code. For example, it could be things like, you know, is the, uh, is the function properly initialized or sorry, is the variable properly initialized or not? You can do that using a test script. Nonetheless, Test scripts are very, very useful for automation because you'll see a lot of times that when you're actually creating a piece of code and you write a test, it does take some effort to write a test. So if I did already write the test, why throw it away at any point, leave it. And, but one thing you'll see quickly is that the test suite that you're creating gets to expand quite quickly, okay? You begin with five tests and you get 10, now you got 100, now you got 1,000, okay? And you don't want to be doing all of these tests manually. You want to get a test script to do that, not just to run the test, but that test script can run the test, check the output, see if it passes and fails. So it does the evaluation and also create a report for you. Okay. So all of this can be done automatically for us. And this was, is done through some um, ex executable test script. Okay. So I'll stop here today. Uh, guys at home, you have any questions? No, thank you, Doctor. Okay, uh, guys here, Sadun. All right, so I'll see you next week, inshallah. So I'm gonna make this uh, stop recording.